Hi. Um, so welcome to day one of the Sci-Fi Tools plenary session on behalf of myself, uh, Tom Kessel, and my co-chair, Anna Eisenman. Um, so this track is a chance for projects, some of core, some new, to present Lightning Talk style updates of their status and plans. Uh, the maintainers and contributors to these projects are, are going to be attending the conference all week. So if you run into them in the hallway or the Tools Plenary Slack channel, please do not be shy, say hello, ask how they're doing, ask, you know, discuss what you need and such. Uh, in addition, uh, NumFocus will be holding open hours in their sponsor booth for their sponsor projects, which is another chance to talk to the maintainers of those projects. Um, and without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Stefan Vanderbilt, who will tell us about a coordination project in the scientific Python ecosystem. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce to you a new planning effort for better coordinating the scientific Python ecosystem. So unlike the other talks in this session, this talk is not about one specific tool, but rather about all the tools and how they work together. In the uh, early days of the SciPy conference, we had fewer than 50 attendees, and many of those were core library developers. So it was easy to get everyone around a table and to talk about important decisions that affected several projects but that hasn't been possible for quite some time. Unsurprisingly then, one of the uh, concerns we've heard from users is that the ecosystem sometimes lacks coherence. And uh, to address that, we are launching an effort to get projects talking to one another again, to strategize about their joint feature, uh, future and to make that future a reality. Specifically, we have the following aims. We want to uh, create a mechanism through which the community can establish cross-project policies to improve common engineering infrastructure, to organize topic-focused developer events to uncover needs, to write a community-vetted strategic plan, and to help projects develop their own grant proposals and to get funded. We have started work on the first aim of the project, that is a mechanism through which the community can establish cross-project policies. These uh, policy documents we call specs for scientific Python ecosystem coordination documents. And these documents will function similarly to PEPs, NEPs, SKIPs, or any of the other enhancement proposals, except that they will be relevant to multiple projects in the ecosystem. These documents will be recommendations written up by the community and their authority will derive from endorsement by popular libraries. The spec has the following life cycle. First, it gets discussed on the Scientific Python Discussion Forum, and we hope that this forum will eventually become a gathering place for many of the projects in the ecosystem. Once it is clear that the idea has merit, it will become a markdown document filed as a pull request on the Scientific Python GitHub repository. Then the spec will be guided through acceptance stages by community volunteers known as the Spec Steering Committee. These are the current members of the committee who have volunteered their time to facilitate the spec process. It should be noted uh, that the emphasis is specifically on facilitation rather than gatekeeping. And again, the specs will derive the authority from endorsement by projects in the ecosystem. We also thank these core projects who have agreed to serve as the initial spec endorsers. If you have a great idea for improving the scientific Python ecosystem, please don't hesitate to reach out. And finally, we look forward to working with you all in bringing the ecosystem together more closely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Um, so our next speaker is Isabella, who will be telling us about the progress of Jupiter. And sharing. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. I am Isabella. I'm actually a UX UI designer at Quonsite Labs, but I'm here today as a representative of the Jupyter community. So and for anyone who might not know, Jupyter is a series of open source projects that produce software, standards, and um, services for interactive computing. So we've got a lot of projects to cover. I'll be trying to go quick. Of course, though, we wouldn't be able to do this without our community. So the first thing we want to do is thank all the contributors and give a special welcome to everyone who is a new contributor in the past year. 
Of course, we also have our Distinguished Contributors Program, which is a way that we acknowledge people who've spent a significant amount of time on impactful projects. So big congrats to our 2021 contributors, and I look forward to seeing who's next next year. It could be you, you never know. So feel free to join. I'll be starting with Jupyter Hub today. So Jupyter Hub is our multi-user interface for notebooks. Jupyter Hub 2.0 is on its way. And some of the big changes that come with that are more fine-grained permission control and changes to the API that make it scale better for more users. Of course, though, these are really big changes. And one of the things that we'd love to ask for is help in testing this, right? Try it out in different spaces and give us feedback so we can make sure that 2.0 is as strong as it can be, even as we make all these big changes. We also have Binder, which is a shareable live coding environments, and Zero to Jupyter Hub, which is the fastest way to deploy Jupyter Hub. So Zero to Jupyter Hub has reached 1.0. Huzzah! I'm so excited for this team. That's a big push there. And also with Binder, it continues to be a big influence, right? We're up to about 200,000 launches for binders per week, which I find both astounding and also really easy to believe considering how many binders I personally run into. So that's great to hear too. Next, I have Jupyter Lab, which is at 3.0 now. There's a lot of big changes that came with Jupyter Lab 3.0, but some of the ones the community wanted me to point out were you no longer need Node.js as a requirement. There is a single package install, and of course, the long-awaited real-time collaboration is happening. You can try this out on your own, but you can also come collaborate with us in a Jupyter Lab meeting since we're using this to test notes. So I would recommend joining in and see how that's going. We also though, have projects that are building on top of this. So RetroLab, for example, is a project that creates a classic notebook-like interface, but all out of JupyterLab components so that you get the benefits of that new code, but also an interface that might be more familiar to you. And moving forward, going towards JupyterLab 3.1 and on to 4, we have a roadmap for this that may, should make it easier for you to see what projects you can take part in. We have a lot of different topics if you're interested in anything. But some of our current efforts are to improve performance, especially of large notebooks, and accessibility, both of which I am happy to invite you to join them, even if you think this is something new to you. We also can't forget, though, IPython and IPyKernel. We have a new contributor to this, or a new core contributor, I should say. And so big congrats to them. It's great to see people you know, continuing to put effort here, since this is foundational to the rest of our work. IPyKernel 6.0 is out, and it has full compatibility with Zeus Python, supports debugger, and captures all outputs, including C libraries. We also have IPython on a monthly release, which is awesome. It's currently at 7.25, and as we move on to 8, asking for help porting the test suite to PyTest, though I know there are many other issues you can go with as well to go visit their repos. Finally, I want to bring up Interact's newer project, Testbook which is a framework for testing code in notebooks. This is a pretty new project. There's a lot of different ways that you can contribute right now and a lot of different work. So I would recommend trying out Testbook and then go see what's happening there. They definitely could use people trying it out and giving some of their tests as documentation. Of course, though, this is just a really quick overview of a lot of projects. Jupyter is huge, and I had a lot of help gathering this info, so thank you to them. Feel free, though, to drop in on jupiter.org. That's a great place to get started on what paths you can take in the Jupyter ecosystem. I'll also encourage you to go to the Jupyter community calendar so you can see events, so you can actually meet other people working on this and solve problems together. Jupyter community calls are one of those events where you can meet cross projects. You meet a lot of people working on a lot of different things in one place, and those are always on the last Tuesday of the month. And I would love to greet you there in the future. There's one in two weeks. So feel free to join us and have a great rest of your conference. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Isabella. Up next is Jeff to uh, tell us about uh, pandas. While I get the. Hello, everyone. Oh uh, boy, wait, sorry. I'm having issues with the PowerPoint, Jeff. Um, 
Um, give me 30 seconds. That's not helpful. Uh, Are we seeing screens? We are. Thank you so much, Thomas. All right, so I'm Jeffrey Beck. I've been, um, just advanced a couple slides here. Um, this is important legal information. I work for Two Sigma. Um, you can read it in your spare time. One more slide, please. Um, I've been a core committer to Pandas for quite some time, um, and I currently work as a senior engineer at uh, Two Sigma. Uh, next slide. So, uh, this is an oldie but a goodie slide. If you don't know what Pandas is, Pandas sits on top of some of the foundational libraries uh, in, the, in the data science ecosystem. This is thanks to uh, Jake Baron Plus. This is an old slide from, I think, 2015. And you can see where uh, Pandas sits here. Pandas is a data processing package. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this is a, a, a reprise on a very old slide. Um, you know, Pandas has had a lot of activity lately. These are like Stack Overflow questions. I updated this to 2021. So either we have a lot of bugs or it's popular or probably both. Next slide, please. So uh, in the past year, we have actually had quite some activity. We've had three major releases um, with, uh, you know, quite a number of patch releases on each one. We generally have um, about a six month uh, release cadence quite some contributors um, and we've been attempting to pair our backlog you know we do thousands of issues and prs for each release so hopefully this will keep going next slide please so one of the biggest um, changes in pandas we have almost fully typed the entire code base it's still actually private um, but it will become public uh, shortly so similar to numpy we're going to be exposing uh, you know fully typed pandas signatures um, you know, as a public uh, facing component soon. So this will be exciting for a lot of the uh, IDs out there. Next slide, please. Um, so just some highlights from various releases. Uh, in 1.1, this was a reminder, this was last year. Um, you know, things like we added uh, support using uh, FS spec, which is a uh, basically a file system specification, uh, you know, Python ecosystem wide. So things like example, when you do read CSV and you do uh, GCS colon, it's gonna work for you. Um, we've added a lot of things, a lot of different uh, extension types, string extension types, and we'll touch on this a uh, little bit later with a little demo. Um, some other things that are of note, uh, you can now sort with by keys, so matching the signature of uh, sorting. Um, we've added a couple of convenience methods like dataframe.compare to compare two data frames and give you a, a resulting diff set. Um, and we've, I'll show this a little bit in a second. Um, for example, for group by transform and ag, you can now do this with Numba, potentially using um, multi-cores for that. Next slide, please. In release 1.2, which was uh, released close to the end of last year, um, we've added additional extension types, namely float array, plus we added support for uh, group by um, exponential weighting moving average as a first class citizen. Next slide, please. And in 1.3, which just came out uh, very recently, we've added support for reading and writing XML. Um, as well as an interesting uh, exponential weighted moving average online method for uh, marginal calculations, a lot of styler updates, and some uh, vast improvements in uh, string D types uh, using Pi Arrow as a backend. So, one more slide, please. So, here is an example of a demo of, so this is in 1.3, just came out. Uh, now we automatically will defer uh, if you have Pi Arrow installed to using, and you have to use the, the string D type here. Um, we'll have vast acceleration on using string D types, which is great. Next slide, please. Um, so this is in uh, all the past releases that we've just been talking about. Um, we allow you to do uh, number compiled functions uh, in example uh, uh, rolling apply, and this is um, awesome for performance. And plus you can actually dispatch to multi cores with this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, interesting addition to 1.3. This allows you to do um, marginal EMA calculations. So we keep state in these, and this is a sort of a new class of functions that we're exposing in Pandas um, these days. And we'll eventually hopefully expand these to other areas, but it's pretty cool, especially when doing long EMAs. Next slide, please. And uh, a ton of Styler improvements. Here's just a little minor example, um, you know, showing some convenience functions in Styler. And we've also um, hooked up Styler so you can generate LaTeX for you as well. And next slide. Um, so coming soon, we're hopefully going to be doing Pandas 2.0 pretty soon, um, getting rid of a lot of deprecations and a lot of uh, interesting new features. 
Um, one of those is an experimental array manager. So uh, we're actually, uh, as an option, instead of just block manager, now you can actually keep your uh, internally, it'll be kept as single um, arrays. This will improve things, among other things, copy view semantics. We're also been experimenting with uh, 2D extension arrays. And next slide. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Have a good SciPy. Thank you, Jeff. Um, up next is Thomas Elliott to tell us about X-ray. X -ray. Thank you. Can you hear and see me OK? Yes, you look. I can you see my slides? And we can. OK, great. So I'm Tom Nicholas. I'm here in my capacity as a member of X-Ray's core development team. Uh, but my day job is I'm a research software engineer at Columbia University. Um, we can talk about X-Ray, our current status, and future plans. So just a very brief recap for those of you who don't use X-Ray. X-Ray provides data structures for labeled multidimensional arrays. It's inspired by Pandas, but intended for n-dimensional arrays, like NumPy-like arrays instead of tabular data. Uh, it's based around the NetCDF data model, so you can also think of it as an in-memory representation of a NetCDF file format, which is obviously a common scientific file format. Um, this is a classic image we use to demonstrate what an X-ray data structure looks like. So this whole thing would be a single data set object. You can see that it contains multiple n-dimensional arrays, either as data variables or coordinates, the difference being that data variables are used for computation and coordinates are used to describe what the data means. Um, along, instead of axes, you have indexes, um, which label, sorry, you have dimensions, which are uh, selected along by indexes. At the moment, we use pandas indexes for this, but I'll come back to that. And then carried around with the object is arbitrary metadata in the form of attributes. So the current state of X-Ray, we have, we recently did a user survey. We have lots of daily scientific users, which is encouraging to see. Um, a lot of people said they literally use X-Ray every day. Uh, but one thing that we learned from the user survey was um, there was some documentation improvements we made, which we've made some of, but that's an ongoing process. Uh, we have grant support through NumFocus and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and um, associated um, people work on it like I do via the Pangeo project. And some of this has paid for recent development work, which I'll talk about in a second, and also for a regular maintainer. Um, the library is robust, uh, but it's not technically at 1.0 because there are several um, large feature improvements that we are in the process of adding. So these improvements are future plans. Um, one that's basically complete is a backends refactor. So originally X-Ray was um, more closely tied to NetCDF, but now it's been refactored to allow to make it more easy to uh, load and save to all types of files, such as bazaar or like GeoTIFF and so on. Um, and that was done through um, BeOpen. Uh, another generalization that we're performing is uh, flexible indexes. So at the moment, you're tied to using pandas index, but the idea is that you will soon be able to plug any type of uh, pandas-like index to label your dimensions with. And this has various uses, but one simple case might be if you wanted a periodic index that represented wrapping round latitude on the Earth, for example, you could plug your own periodic index into the, into the dimension to represent that organically. Uh, a big one is uh, duck array wrapping. Uh, so this is an ongoing process as well. And the idea here is that in the moment, X-Ray wraps in either NumPy arrays or Dask arrays for parallel computation. But there's no reason why, in principle, we can't wrap any type of array that conforms to the right NumPy enhancement proposal, like API specifications. Um, so for example, unit aware integration via Pint arrays is almost ready. Um, and then there's potential for wrapping all sorts of other types of arrays, including sparse arrays, GPU arrays like QPy, or even um, machine learning tools like PyTorch or JAX. Finally, um, we also want to generalize the library eventually through um, more general data structures, both at the high and low level of abstraction. So we want we have currently have a private variable class that we uh, use internally, but we're planning to make that public. Um, which basically just stores a single uh, data variable without the associated um, coordinates and metadata. And then at the other end, we want to also provide a high, uh, higher level data structure that it can essentially contain multiple different data sets. And uh, this work hasn't started yet, but funding has been applied for through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. 
Um, thanks. Um, contact me on GitHub or by email if you have any questions. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jim to tell us about Awkward Array. Okay. Am I sharing screen yet? Am I sharing screen? Yes, you are. I understand. Great. Okay. So I'll be, I'm Jim Pavarsky. I'll be talking about Awkward Array. Uh, Awkward Array is a rather new project. So if you haven't heard of it, I'll, I'll give some explanation first. Uh, it's about performing NumPy-like idioms on JSON-like data. So suppose you have some data like, like the following, um, where you have nested objects and variable length lists and such. Um, what Awkward Array allows you to do is it allows you to perform NumPy-like expressions, where you can do slices and vectorize functions, such as uh, this NumPy ufunc. Uh, and this particular expression would, would result in the following. You pick out the y's and slice up the, the nested lists within. Uh, the equivalent Python can be a lot more can be a lot more verbose because it has to unpack and repack this this object. So some of these expressions can be very concise, and generally they're they're quite a bit faster than than pure Python uh, using a lot less memory. So uh, this is perhaps a too ambitious example. Uh, we, can, we can talk about it offline, but I wanted to show you know doing real data analysis with large data sets coming from parquet files discovering non-trivial things like fourths and fifths are common in, in music with these uh, variable length songs in the million song data set. Uh, and then doing exactly the same thing in Numba because I want to show that uh, we want to attach Awkward Array to the common tools in the scientific Python ecosystem. And sometimes it's hard to express things in vectorized functions and you want to write your for loops, but you don't want it to be slow. So num numpa, sorry, Numba integration was, was uh, an early thing that we wanted to do. As for news, what are we doing now? We are actively extending this beyond its original domain, which was particle physics. So uh, we, we saw variable length nested data as a common problem. So when we, when we developed this uh, for particle physics, we didn't define it in terms of uh, particles, positions, momenta, collision events, and such. We defined it in terms of nested lists, records, and missing data so that it can be used in other scientific fields. And a few scientists in, in other fields have been trying it out, and they've been revealing our gaps in scope. Like radio astronomers realize that, that you know, we need uh, complex numbers, and data scientists need date times, and both of these things weren't needed for particle physics. So that's exactly how we want to grow. Uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg, I'm sure. So uh, we're starting a three-year project. This is funded by the National Science Foundation Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. Uh, to ensure that Awkward Array works for use cases, use cases across the scientists. And in particular, in a big box here, we're actively seeking to collaborate with scientists who have awkward data problems to ensure that Awkward Array work, uh, works for them. So uh, if you have a problem like this, we'd really like to hear from you. And I've got my email address on the next slide. Uh, we're particularly interested in problems that, uh, that solving them will lead to better integration with other scientific Python libraries uh, and GPUs. So Dask integration is one of the first things we want, really want to do next with this, uh, because we can vertically scale with Numba. We want to horizontally scale with Dask. Uh, GPUs, full GPU supports so everything you can do on a CPU. We want to be able to do on a GPU is also a major part of this project. So this is all the contact information, um, how you can find, how you can install it, get uh, documentation, and contact me. I'll also be in the uh, the SciPy Tools uh, Slack channel. Thank you very much. Uh, up next, we have Jared to tell us about NetworkX. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, I'm pleased to be able to provide an update on the NetworkX project. Let's see if I can get my slide moving. There we go. Yeah, so uh, it's been a really exciting year for NetworkX. Uh, despite being one of the oldest projects in the ecosystem, uh, with nearly 20 years of steady development, uh, this is our first year of uh, funding where we were able to have a dedicated uh, development effort. Um, as you know, funding for the core projects have uh, lagged behind the growing importance of these tools for scientific research, and we've not been unique. Uh, we, so we'd really like to extend a special thanks to the Chan Zuckerberg Institute's uh, Essential Open Source Software for Science program, 
uh, which gave us our, our first funding in almost nearly 20 years of development, um, continuous development. And this is uh, more has been really important for us uh, in allowing us to address years of decades of technical debt uh, through refactoring our code, improving performance. Uh, we're working uh, very steadily on making a major new release. Um, uh, also uh, doing a lot of work on focusing on growing the developer community. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about uh, the major release in the developer community uh, a little bit later today in uh, building uh, the NetworkX developer community talk. Uh, we've had a number of releases during this period. So we uh, last August, uh, after working over the summer, we were able to get a 2.5 release out. Uh, that had over 200 PRs by 92 contributors. And uh, we are in the process of getting 2.6 out. Uh, I released it last week, but I had to yank it uh, because of an issue with our dependencies uh, and then didn't get it back out just because I was preparing for this uh, week of talks. Um, but we've got a lot more work over the last year. So we've got 360 PRs by 91 contributors. And uh, we'll be releasing a 2.7, which will be a, a little smaller uh, release uh, fairly s shortly after 2.6, and then 3 at the end of the year. Um, and 3 will really be just mainly you know, not a huge uh, break for users, but mainly focused on uh, cleaning up years of technical debt and uh, removing old legacy code um, and getting us prepared for a new generation of developers, hopefully. Yeah, so uh, uh, this one of the major things we did was code improvements. So this includes many improvements. Uh, we fixed a lot of bugs and algorithms. We sped up algorithms. Uh, we improved our drawing utilities. Uh, in particular, uh, we now have the ability to draw self loops uh, which was a nice improvement. We've uh, increased uh, our import or reduced the amount of time it takes to import. Um, we've made some major improvements to our testing and documentation infrastructure. Uh, we've also improved test coverage and removed legacy code. Uh, despite having been around for almost two decades, there's some major algorithms still missing. So uh, we addressed that this year and both uh, putting in our first algorithms for traveling salesmen and as well as max cut. So for traveling salesmen, we now have Christophides. Um, Classical approximation algorithm and max cut. We have a now we have a, the random uh, partitioning as well as um, some heuristics uh, for computing max cut. We've also added functionality for more uh, niche uh, algorithms such as Panther similarity, which is a type of uh, way of computing uh, the similarity between different nodes or vertices in your graph. And uh, this is just you know scratching a surface. We've had tons and tons of new functions. Um, out of that ninety one. 92 contributors we've had over the last year. Many of those were new uh, first time contributors and um, brought in stuff from their own research or work. Yeah, and then we've also made major improvements to documentation. So uh, at the top, I've got a little image of our new uh, documentation page. We've switched from read the docs to Sphinx, Pride Data Sphinx Scout theme, uh, which a lot of the projects have switched to recently. Uh, Give a shout out to them. Uh, we've also greatly improved our Sphinx Gallery, which is another great project. Um, and so i uh, just got a few little graphs here. But you know, if you go to our documentation page and hit uh, Gallery, uh, all these little icons are clickable. You can find the code that generated them. Uh, we've also finally added a uh, another site for uh, more long-form narrative guides. Uh, and we're starting to uh, add to that right now. Um, but these are basically like longer-form educational materials. Uh, they're developed and curated by the NetworkX developer community uh, and use Jupyter Notebooks and uh, are viewable up on Binder. And then uh, a lot of effort uh, has gone into really building up our community uh, structure and process. So uh, despite 20 years of uh, being around, we had no official logo. We now have a logo. Uh, we finally got our own domain, networkx.org. Uh, we finally joined NumFocus. Uh, and we've done a lot of work on uh, doc developer documentation and developer process. So our developer guide, I've just got the little um, table of contents here. And almost all of this is new or greatly improved. So we've uh, officially set up a core developer team. Uh, we have a steering committee now uh, with members of our uh, community, which I'll talk more about uh, in later today. We finally added a code of conduct, uh, which was a you know, very lightly edited version of the SciPy code of conduct. Uh, you know, Inspired by a second image, we've added mission and values. We greatly expanded our contributor guide. We've added mentored projects, um, which we used for our Google Summer of Code uh, participation this summer. Uh, we also had a new contributor FAC. Uh, the core developer guide was improved. Uh, we also improved the release process and then added a deprecation document roadmap. And um, we now have uh, NetworkX uh, enhancement proposals like um, NumPy and Python and other projects. Uh, and 
that is it. Uh, thanks, everyone. And I look forward uh, to hearing uh, more from you. And uh, hopefully, many of you will come to our talk this afternoon. Thank you, Jared. And next up is Andre um, to tell us about O4Tran. And I apologize for the mispronunciation. No, it's perfect. Uh, uh, Thomas, would you mind sharing the slides? I am I am working on it. Awesome. So I'll talk about L4Tran. L4Tran is a Fortran compiler. Uh, it's, it's an interactive Fortran compiler that you can use in Jupyter um, as a kernel. And it compiles to binaries like other Fortran compilers. And um, I want to thank, uh, thank all the collaborators and contributors so far. We are very happy that our developer community is growing. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, Tomas, please. Sorry. So the motivation for L4Tran that will be on the next slide is um, we want to uh, essentially implement and have everything you would expect from modern Fortran. So we want cross-platform compilation to binaries. Uh, we want interactivity like Python uh, or Julia. It's, it's, it's the same idea. Uh, we want nice interactive error messages and warnings. Um, we want automatic interoperability with other languages uh, like Python so that you don't have to write Python wrappers by hand at all. You'll be able to use eventually any Fortran module right away. Uh, we want translation to other languages. So uh, we already have a C++ translation backend, which takes Fortran code and translates into C++. And we want to add other backends, such as Julia and Python also. We want automatic formatting, uh, language server, so that you can use it in VS Code and so on. We want to run well on modern architectures, uh, like GPUs. Uh, we want uh, clean design, make it usable as a library. Uh, we want um, you know static analysis and all the other you know once you go this route you can imagine all kinds of nice features you would like to have and so we want to have a, a kind of an infrastructure so that we can implement and really improve the Fortran ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. So what's the current status? Uh, a couple of years ago, we started with the Python implementation, uh, and since then we rewrote into C++ uh, for robustness and speed. Uh, to give you roughly the idea of the scope of the project, we have about 6,000 uh, commits in master and about 1,000 uh, merge requests uh, merged. Um, it works interactively in Jupyter. It's in Conda, so you can do Conda install L4Tran and, um, and also install Jupyter, and you can use it right away. It should just work on all platforms. Um, we have several backends. The default one is LLVM backend, which allows to uh, compile Fortran 2 binaries and also work uh, to work interactively. We have x86 backend, which can compile to, it generates x86 machine code directly. Um, it facilitates very fast compilation. We have a C++ translation backend, which takes Fortran code and translates into C++ that you can then either use or if you want to move away from Fortran, or if you want to integrate your Fortran code with maybe C++ code, and you don't want to have a Fortran dependency, so you can use that. Um, we have pretty much complete Fortran 2018 parser and formatter. Uh, there are some little bugs that people, you know, want to know about discover. So if you report it, we'll fix it. But for the most part, it's it's pretty much complete. And we are now working on on the semantic and analysis and and compiling all the features. Um, we can compile, so most of the Fortran 95 features are at least partially implemented, but some corner cases are missing and we are now working on those to ensure we can actually compile robustly any Fortran 95. Uh, we have uh, three Google Summer of Code students this year. Um, we are also part of NumFocus and we are uh, trying to grow the developer community. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the near-term plans first? So by the end of the summer, we are hoping to robustly compile Fortran 95, and we are trying to, we are using the SNAP and DFT Atom projects as kind of proxy apps for um, for, for, for um, ensuring that, that they can actually compile and work correctly. Uh, once we get there, we'll release the minimum viable product, MVP, and, and get the first users. And the longer term, right after that, uh, plans are to eventually uh, compile all Fortran 2018, so 
any Fortran. Currently, we have a, only a free form parser, so we uh, we plan to include a fixed form parser um, so that we can actually compile F77. That will be very helpful, for example, for the SciPy project, which has a lot of uh, F77 code. Uh, we want to grow the community of developers. Uh, we want to have automatic Python and C++ wrap wrappers. So in Python, you would just import a library and you'll be able to use any Fortran module right away without having to write these wrappers by hand because the L-Fortran compiler would wrap that for you. Uh, we want to have a robust translation to C++. Uh, we want to, and also people requested uh, Julia uh, uh, translation also, so we, I plan to do that. Once, uh, once we get there, of course, uh, it would be interesting to translate Fortran to Python and Numba. I expect less performance, but it might be helpful um, for people. So we would like to do that also. Um, and obviously, all other things from the motivation. We are looking for, uh, we have quite a few uh, volunteers and Google Summer of Code students, but we are looking for more. If you are interested in any of that, uh, please get in touch with us. We are happy to get you up to speed. You might think it's very complicated to contribute to, uh, to, a, to a compiler, but it's it's not actually. It's very easy. I'm happy to get you up to speed and um, and get you started. And it's a very rewarding work. So if you're interested, please uh, get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the the last uh, the last presentation is a video um, uh, from Anessa about. Hi everyone, my name is Nessa Parson. I have been contributing to NumPy for the past two years. And last March, I joined the NumPy Steering Council. Today, I'll present an annual update about NumPy. There are people behind every software. So I'll start with the update on the NumPy team. We continue to grow. In the past 12 months, Sayed Adel, Bas Van Beek, Chunlin Fein and Melissa Mendonca have joined the NumPy development team. Also, Melissa and I have joined the NumPy Steering Council. We have accomplished quite a lot in the past 12 months. In July 2020, the NumPy survey team, in partnership with students and faculty from a master's course in survey methodology, jointly hosted by the University of Michigan and the University of Maryland, conducted the first official NumPy community survey. Over 1,000 users from 75 countries participated. You can read the full results report following a link shared on the screen. The survey was an effort of an international group of 31 volunteers. I'd like to thank all of them for their dedication to the project amidst the extraordinary challenges of 2020. Also, a huge thank you to everyone who took part in this survey. We couldn't do it without your support. The work begins, not ends, with survey results. Several initiatives are already underway. In September 2020, the first official academic paper on NumPy was published in Nature, 14 years after the release of the first version of NumPy. It was exciting to see all the long-time NumPy maintainers finally being recognized for their contributions to modern science. It's worth mentioning that despite its significance and maturity, until 2018, NumPy was a fully volunteer effort. In November 2020, NumPy and OpenVLAS were awarded the second grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative through cycle three of the Essential Open Source Software for Science program. Melissa Mendonca is the principal investigator of this grant. For NumPy, the grant is funding the work on improving documentation, modernizing NumPy's integration with Fortran tools via F2Py, and the community building. In January 2021, we released NumPy 120. Some 684 pull requests contributed by 184 people, mostly volunteers, have been merged. This was the largest NumPy release to date. The two most exciting new features are type annotations for large parts of NumPy, and the new NumPy typing submodule containing array-like and D-type-like 
aliases that users and downstream libraries can use when adding type annotations in their own code. And the second feature is multi-platform CMD compiler optimizations. In April 2021, NumPy tutorials part of numpy.org went live. The goal of this repository is to provide high quality interactive educational resources, both for self-learning and for teaching others. The NumPy documentation team did a fantastic job there. I highly recommend checking out all the tutorials. And if you would like to contribute to this repository, reach out to Melissa Mendonca. The last piece of news from the NumPy team is that the 2021 NumPy Community Survey is now live. We would love to have your input once again. To participate, use the QR code on the screen or head to the NumPy Twitter page for a direct link. This concludes my update on the NumPy project. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, and with that, that's the end of day one of the SciPy, uh, the, the tools plenary. Uh, thank you for thank you for attending, everyone. We apologize for running a bit over time. And with that, I'd like to release you to the break. <laughs>